We all know Spirit Airlines. They're somewhat famous for being infamously horrendous. It seems like every year we see a majority of passenger complaints and headlines about Spirit. We're here to test that today in a unique way. Today we're at Newark's Terminal B where we take a flight out of the worst terminal at the worst airport on the worst airline, but we test just how good you can make it using every possible perk. And seeing just how it compares to other transcontinental flights as we make the six hour journey across the country to Oakland, California. You the timestamps below if you're wanting to find something specific. Now off to Newark. Terminal B at Newark is home to pretty much all international flights that aren't operated by United. There's a couple domestic carriers here, but most domestic flights have moved to Terminal A since it was completed, leaving behind almost entirely low-cost carriers and Alaska. Mid-2020 saw the opening of the brand new check-in area. Even if the gate areas remain largely untouched, upstairs we see check-in for most international carriers. We see things like Air India, Singapore, Aer Lingus, TAP Portugal, etc. Downstairs is where we see mostly domestic carriers, including our space for Spirit Airlines. The check-in area for Spirit consists of almost entirely bag drop counters with one agent counter, pushing most people towards the self-check-in kiosks, hoping to free things up a bit. There are a couple signs in this area. First is one of the many ads for the big front seats as they try to persuade people to purchase that upgrade. In addition, as part of the check-in, you may have to check bags. Spirit charges for checked bags and carry-on bags. The only way to get a free bag is if it fits under the seat in front of you. This cost raises the closer you get to departure being at $50 the time of booking, $55 after booking but before check-in, $60 during check-in, $90 at the airport, and $100 if you wait until the gate. For carry-on prices, add a couple dollars on top of that. They're trying to basically incentivize checked bags as it speeds up the boarding and deplaning process. In addition to that, you can only bring 40 pounds or 18 kilograms. This is about 10 pounds or 5 kilograms less than the average. If your bag exceeds the 40 pound limit, you're going to incur an additional cost on top of that. At least they don't charge for boarding passes. Airlines like Breeze and Allegiant charge $5 if you need a printed boarding pass at the airport. Checked in, back upstairs, we find the security checkpoint. The security checkpoint here was insanely backed up, with wait times of 55 minutes for the normal line and 30 minutes for the pre-check line. I have clear and pre-check, and even that combined took 20 minutes as compared to the 1 to 2 minutes it took at San Francisco for my flight out to Newark. Now we are on to the first of three wings of Newark's Terminal B. They aren't exactly connected, one of the major problems at Newark, especially for connecting passengers. When I arrived from San Francisco, I had to leave security, hop on the horrendously inefficient air train to this terminal, then go back through security. This terminal is still reeling in its identity after most airlines ran to the new Terminal A. It's why we see abandoned lounges like this old Delta Sky Club left unoccupied, and the seating area across from it with chairs and vending machines which looked like it was probably a lounge in its past life. Speaking of which, as an ultra low cost carrier, there's no such thing as a Spirit Airlines lounge here or anywhere else in the world. Closest you'll get is a Waffle House. So we walk the corridor to wait in the main gate area. As we walk the corridor, we can see the aging interior as Newark rushes to complete the renovations of the old Terminal A, which is when this terminal will most likely be demolished and hopefully renovated to make some more space. The end of the hallway is the main rotunda. This section of Terminal B has 10 gates, largely for Alaska and Spirit Airlines. Since there's no lounges, all passengers for the 10 gates have to scatter around the circular collection of seating. It definitely got packed, but looked like there were still enough seats just not enough charging ports, and the ones that did exist were in kind of an odd spot. Gate 45B would be ours for the flight to Oakland today. The aircraft had just arrived from Orlando. We were going to be on an A320neo, which is two years old and has lived its whole life here with Spirit. Despite Spirit's notorious reputation, they actually boast one of the youngest fleet ages in the world, which keeps efficient aircraft in their fleet helping keep costs down. You'll notice that Spirit boards by group, with groups 1 through 4. Group 1 is Spirit's Gold Elite status members and people who have purchased a carry-on. Here's the gripe I have with that. Since I wanted to test out every possible perk on my flight today, I paid $10 for priority boarding and only received Group 2 boarding. 
Now airlines like United do the same thing, but only because Group 1 is reserved for first or business class. For an airline without premium cabins like Spirit, there's no reason that $10 shouldn't include Group 1 boarding in my opinion. This means that by the time I got on board, there was already about 20 to 30 people on board and it filled quick, making it a bit difficult to film content. Now for the biggest perk of the day. On a good bunch of Spirit's aircraft, they have a few seats right at the front, labeled as the big front seats. These seats cost an additional fee, almost double the cost of the base ticket. For those curious, at the end of this video we will discuss the exact cost of all this as compared to the competition on these transcontinental flights. Anywho, these seats look very similar to the couch style domestic first class seats on airlines like United, Delta, or American. Looking around the seat, however, you'll start to notice the major differences in how they spiritify it up for a lack of better words. First off, the headrest. It does exist, and it is labeled with the name of the product, but it's not adjustable. It doesn't slide, tilt, curl, nothing. The seat itself is far more comfortable than the average Spirit Airlines seats, which are like sitting on cardboard, although they aren't quite as comfortable as the other domestic first class seats in the world. For contrast, here's the normal economy seats on this Spirit aircraft, the worst seat pitch or legroom in the US. Leave it to us to take something as cool as flying through a metal tube at 40,000 feet and make it insufferable. Against the window is an armrest, which includes the slot for the tray table which folds out and can sit folded or opened. In front of us is the bulkhead, which is unfortunate since we have to put bags and laptops in the overhead bins for taxi, takeoff, and landing. Above that is two windows, honestly not bad for a configuration that's this cramped. One of the biggest things is the legroom. In their normal economy seats, Spirit Airlines is the worst in the US with 28 inches of legroom, more than 2 inches behind the worst major carrier, and 4.5 and inches less than the best in the US, JetBlue. The big front seat adds 8 inches to this, so we now have 36 inches of legroom, in addition to 20 inches of width, 3 inches more than the regular seats. Believe it or not, this is actually exactly the same as Delta and American and only a few inches smaller than United if comparing to other domestic first classes. We just get burned by the bulkhead since we can't put our feet up under the seat in front of us. Between the seats is this little countertop. It was okay for little drinks, but it's not that simple, you'll see once we get airborne. Behind that, which I forgot to get footage of until in flight, is this padded armrest, which is actually pretty comfortable and wide. Lastly, a major perk of these narrow-body airplanes is that air vents are a given. Not sure why larger international aircraft haven't gotten that memo. And that's it. You'll definitely notice a few things missing. First off, no seatback entertainment options. Spirit doesn't offer any sort of in-flight entertainment, so come equipped. Also, no charging ports. That's perhaps the biggest drawback. On short flights, it's not a huge deal, but on the longest flight in their network with six hours ahead of us, I had to bring an external battery and try and charge that, my phone, and my laptop in the airport, made tougher by the lack of charging ports. Also, for a domestic first class, there isn't a single amenity. This is because it isn't a domestic first class. Technically, we're just like any other passenger on this airplane, just with a little better seat. This means none of the amenities that you'd get on major airlines domestic first class before departure like hot towels and champagne. Lastly, and perhaps most surprisingly, the seat doesn't even recline. You think you're getting a domestic first class seat, but keep in mind you're just getting a slightly better, slightly more roomy seat, and you're still on Spirit Airlines. And as we watch this United 757 taxi back into the gate, a little about why Spirit is the way that it is. In aviation, carriers or airlines are grouped in a couple categories such as major airlines, regional airlines, and low-cost carriers. Spirit falls into the category known as an ultra-low-cost carrier. The goal of ultra-low-cost carriers is to reduce the experience down to the bare minimum in order to offer the absolute lowest possible fare. There's a couple things that make an airline an ultra-low-cost carrier. First off, no frills. No free carry-on bags, no free snacks, no free entertainment, no free seat selection, nothing really comes for free. Some of these things can be purchased, others aren't available at all. In addition, with few exceptions, ultra-low-cost carriers like Spirit and Frontier maintain a young fleet. This is because aircraft continue getting more efficient so it helps to have the newest and most efficient aircraft. 
Aircraft also get less efficient as they get older, hence why Ryanair's average aircraft age is 10 years and dropping with new airplanes, while Delta remains around 15 years. On top of this, airport choice is huge. The bigger the airport, typically the more expensive the landing fees and gate slots are. This is why we see major carriers flying from Phoenix to San Francisco, but Allegiant flies from Mesa to Stockton, for example. The next big thing to save on cost is the route structure. Most airlines have a hub and spoke setup. United, for example, will have planes fly into one of their hubs, pick up connecting passengers, and move to its next destination. Ultra-low-cost carriers commonly operate more point-to-point. -point. This way, it reduces the amount of connecting passengers who could potentially miss connections and have to be reaccommodated, in addition to not needing to move bags from plane to plane as much. Allegiant, for example, doesn't even sell reservations with connections, meaning if you book something on your own with a connection through a travel agent or whatnot, they aren't responsible for the transfer. They can also trim the staff to save money. At smaller airports like Fresno, the same people who work the ticket counter may also work the gate and boarding process and may even assist on the ramp. Depending on how you view it, ultra-low-cost carriers are either the best or worst thing to happen to aviation. They're definitely a downgraded service, but they do save people money if done right. If you walk in here expecting a full fare airline's level of service, you'll definitely be disappointed. If you plan ahead of time, and especially if you have a shorter flight, it's an easy way to save some cash. After we took off and said farewell to New York, it was time to explore the entertainment options you get with this seat, or any seat on Spirit Airlines as a matter of fact. As mentioned previously, there's no seatback TVs or personal device entertainment. They do, however, have in-flight Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi can be connected to in your settings or by using the QR code at the seat. The Wi-Fi comes in two strengths, browsing for $17 and streaming for $20, both for the full flight. I opted to prepay for the Wi-Fi before getting on board so I was given a coupon code to use to access my pre-purchased Wi-Fi. I purchased the streaming strength since it was only $3 more. It was strong enough to stream apps like Netflix or Peacock. You can see the speed test here, it was the first time ever on an airplane that the speed has actually shown as fast. So go Spirit I guess for giving us the best Wi-Fi in aviation, who saw that coming? Then was the first snack service. Pulling the tray table out, I'm always worried that they're going to be flimsy. With this little tab on the counter, you can rest the table on it to keep it flat and stable. Now for that snack service, there's a menu card in the seat back pocket. You'll see three tabs, one with alcohol, one with non-alcoholic options, and one with the food and snack options. Looking at the snacks, you'll be able to get chips or sweets, but not exactly a meal. The closest you'll get is the cheese plate or signature snack box. The alcoholic drinks are a somewhat small selection, but a little bit of everything at least. 
The non-alcoholic options has a somewhat normal selection of soft drinks and hot drinks. Everything on this menu comes at an additional cost, however, even a bottle of water. The best thing you can get is a cup of coffee, which can be refilled for free. You can also save money if you plan to purchase multiple items with some dollars off the total cost. I decided to order their signature snack box, a bag of Dots pretzels, and a Coke, ordering three things to get $3 off the total cost of the snack service. All said and done, it was just useless calories. It did fill me up, but was almost exclusively chips or sweets. In my opinion, definitely not worth the $18, however, although still cheaper than the snacks at the Newark airport. As the sun sets, Spirit was the first ultra-low-cost carrier to introduce any sort of premium seats, even if it is a budget version. It has been the only carrier of their type to offer anything of this sort for quite a while. That was until last month when Frontier Airlines announced they would also be rolling out a business class product. And earlier this month, we got a glimpse into what that would look like. For starters, it doesn't come with these couch seats like Spirit. Instead, it will be more like a European business class. Rather than removing seats or reconfiguring the cabin, they're keeping the cabin as is, but blocking the middle seat for the first couple rows with slightly more than their normal 28-inch legroom, but with the middle seat empty to share with your seatmate. I was finding that one for $150 to $160, so I'll let you decide if you think it's worth it. It looks like, as of now, it will work just like Spirit with the cost including only the seat, not bags, not flexibility, not snacks, not priority boarding. With ultra low cost carriers operating a very unique business model, we haven't seen this around the world with airlines like Ryanair, EasyJet, Wizz Air, Air Arabia, and whatnot. So I'm curious to see if any other ultra low cost carriers follow suit. Anyways, that's a topic for a later video because a second snack service was upon us as this flight was six hours long. I decided to try their other main snack option, the cheese platter. I got a Heineken to go along with the cheese plate, which was really just two crackers and three single slices of cheese. Since it was just the two items, no discount on this service, but still a $14 meal, and definitely not worth $14. Essentially, for $32, I ate a bunch of garbage, no real protein, but the best Spirit Airlines has to offer at this time. Fortunately, this is their longest flight, and therefore, if you eat before getting on board, you can probably spend less money, eat better food, and make it through your flight anywhere else. After some of the gnarliest turbulence I've found, I figured we'd take the descent to discuss the cost and comparison of this product. First off, the cost of the flight. The base fare was $92, which at face value is an absolute steal for a 6-hour transcontinental flight, the longest one in their network. Remember that that isn't it, however. I chose to check my bag instead of carrying it on to save a couple dollars, so that was an extra 50 bucks. Then was the priority boarding for 10 bucks, the Wi-Fi for 20, and the food for 32. The biggest fee was for the seat itself. You have to pay to reserve any seat, and the better the seat, the more it costs. So things like exit rows and seats towards the front of the airplane are more expensive. Our big front seat, as it's known, was an additional fee of $125, more than the base fare of the ticket. This brought the total cost of this journey to $329. If we want to compare this with other carriers from Newark to the Bay Area, aside from Spirit, you can find flights on Alaska and United. The average cheapest fare on a daily basis is around $150, only $60 more than the base fare that we paid, however, including a checked bag, in-flight entertainment, charging ports, and free drinks and snacks. A $65 fee if you want all that on Spirit, therefore making Spirit sound not all that worth it. Now if you're smart and you're able to pack a personal item only, charge your devices beforehand, bring your own food, and just want the extra space and legroom on board, you can get the Spirit flight with the big front seat for only $65 more than the Alaska or United flights. This sounds pretty darn good when you compare it to United and Alaska's domestic first class, which is about $200 more than this Spirit flight. But keep in mind it does include couch style seats that actually recline, or even lie flat seats on wide body aircraft in addition to Wi-Fi for $12 less, full meals and unlimited snacks, free check bags, etc. When push comes to shove, there's a few ways to cross the country from Newark. It kind of just comes down to what you value most.
Welcome to Oakland, California, the low-cost hub of the Bay Area. While SFO and San Jose see mostly major airlines, Oakland has struggled to maintain service from United, Delta, and American over the years. Instead, however, operating as a hub for Southwest, but also the main launch point for Spirit and Allegiant. Anyways, today I set out to see if we could make Spirit Airlines, the worst airline in the US, a tolerable experience. The answer is yes, kind of. If things go as planned and you plan appropriately, you can make it to your destination efficiently and cheaply. Now I say that because this was my second attempt at this exact flight and my fourth time recently attempting to fly Spirit. For all but one of those flights, we were delayed or canceled. They tell you to call their customer service for help, but they take hours to answer most times. They also intentionally don't send gate agents at most gates until it's time to board in order to reduce lines building up and slowing down boarding. So there isn't anyone to help you even. As a matter of fact, last time I tried to fly this exact flight, someone showed up 10 minutes after our departure was scheduled to say that we were delayed and then walked away. Not even 15 minutes later, they told us it would be canceled. Now, as someone who works in the industry, I know more than anyone that weather can absolutely ground a flight. Just found it fishy how quickly they canceled rather than reaccommodating people who had missed connections. On top of that, of the 32 flights from the Bay Area to the New York area that day, only one was canceled. Ours. Not a great look. And after a couple months of fighting it, all that I got was a $50 flight voucher after having to buy last minute tickets on Alaska instead to get me there for a wedding. Regardless, this kinda makes one of my points. Spirit's ground staff is some of the worst in the business. I'm sure most of you in the US have seen full on fights at some airports. I know I have. However, the onboard staff is some of the best in the skies. They are always having fun, playing around to keep people entertained, and from talking to them, it sounds like they enjoy working there. Now personally, I can't justify this flight. I'd much rather pay for Alaska or United, or even more options out of JFK. Even for just a tiny bit more money, the perks are worth it. And if you really want the extra space, personally I think springing for the full fare carriers would be the way to go, especially if you can get yourself a wide body. Maybe that's just me, however, because American runs the same aircraft from JFK to SFO with 102 seats, but Spirit runs this route with 182 seat capacity aircraft, and according to our load sheet today, we were about 89% full on this flight. So I guess it goes to show you that people value this flight and value what Spirit offers. Let me know what you think though. What would be your go-to seat across the country? No frills, normal Spirit for $92? Big front seat for $330? or full fare airline economy for 150 versus their business class for 550. Let me know down below. Until next week, however, safe travels. I will see y'all next time.